Namaste, and welcome to our continuing series, Interviews with Aurevillians. I'm happy to say that uh, Holger has agreed to do another interview with us and talk about his life in Oroville and his experiences, and especially in music. Uh, music is such an important art. Sri Aurobindo would almost put it at the very top, along with poetry and and many other things, but music is very high because it brings down something to the earth that we've not experienced before. So many things have been attempted, like the twelve-tone system, which fell flat, <laughs> and, and with uh, so many other, even modern systems that are struggling to express something that's perhaps even inexpressible, but expressible only through music. Mm. I would yeah. say like that, yes. Oh, good. So, Holger, very nice to have you back with us again. I think we were, in our last interview, we, entered, we ended with asking you about Mother and her writing, and now I'd like to ask you about Mother as the avatar in a body. <laughs> Only in the recent years, maybe ten years, maybe eight years, I can make sense of this yoga of the cells thing that I read and said, okay, fine, uh, but do I feel my cells? I don't. So, yeah. But now, um, uh, working with the music has become, in in retrospect, I can see that this is for me the entry, the key to the body. Yes. Um, I take a minute to explain how that is. To play violin, be a violinist, you have to do a lot with getting a pitch right because there are no frets so or keys. Mm -hmm. So. I was, uh, then if you don't get it, it feels bad, so uh, you're always in a little fear, etc. And you get used to this fear, and then you play, and it's like, oh my God, what will be the next tone coming? Is this, oh, mm -hmm. it was too flat, it was too sharp. So this becomes a kind of stress feeling whenever you play violin, in my case, eight hours a day. Would it be the same with all string instruments? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, or it's a wrong key on the piano or so, yeah? or a failed uh, embouchure on the trombone or, mm -hmm. or so. Mm -hmm. we, are, we, we play these instruments with the body. And um, I thought for 35 years or 40 years, I thought the sharper my ear is, the better I will play. And when I fail to play right and in tune, it is because I'm not gifted enough. So I'm mediocre. Then only in the last years I understood if I hear that I play a wrong note, it's too late. So hearing will never bring me the right note. It is only the tool you use to know whether it's right or wrong. But who will play the right note is the body. Only. Mother speaks about this when she went to that concert mm -hmm. of the violinist. Mm -hmm. And she saw this man and he was playing far above what he could normally play. Ah. And then she saw that Isai's hands had entered this man. Yes. Wow. Yes. So here again, the body. So, exactly. So it's a kind of, in this case, a kind of uh, floating consciousness, you could say, physi of physical nature. And 
when one is lucky enough to practice and have time to practice an instrument that much, you are all the time sharpening your consciousness for that body. And you go through, you find then that uh, you need to relax a lot. If you look at somebody like Pavarotti, you understand this yeah. is pure relaxation. Exactly. And where? Because why is this man not enlightened or happy? Why does he eat himself to death with spaghetti? Yeah. Because this is a very, a very limited but very deep realization on the physical. And it has to do with the violin also a lot with the, 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 the cleanliness in the hand, insights, so to speak, in the consciousness of the hand. And that is not isolated. It's in the breathing. It's in, in, in everything. So that is only in the last years I understand how I can now say, now I can say that this work, my work to practice an instrument is my yoga. Well, I want to take up something with you here. My voice teacher, mm -hmm. a great German classical teacher, mm -hmm. um, said to me one time, don't take up yoga. Because Menuhin Hin did, and he was not the same mm. after he did that. Mm. Is that correct in your opinion? Uh, the causality, I think, is wrong. Oh. I think this is not the case. Okay. Um, but, but I would know for sure. I, 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 can, I know of Menuhin that he was, uh, he was, of course, being able to play Chacon with six years mm -hmm. and pretty flawless. Yes. And what he had practiced two years as a child, so impossible, I would yeah, say. Yeah. Yet we have videos of it, so right. unbelievable. Yeah. And then he went, I think with 16, he went to Europe to study with Eugène Isai, yes. who was one of the towering one figures. One of the great ones, yeah. And uh, Isai uh, had him uh, play scales, and then he rejected him. Mm -hmm. He says, I'm not teaching you. Because I'm afraid. When we start with this, you cannot play violin anymore. Oh. So he didn't want to disturb this somewhat unconscious rightness of everything that was given to Menuhin. Yes, yes. And uh, a few years later, Menuhin went as a GI to the Second World War and when he, ca he came back and couldn't play anymore. And that is when he started practicing violin. It didn't take too long for him, but yeah. he really had to relearn playing violin, so I hear. And uh, that is why it's justified Then he said famously uh, playing violin is 1% is inspiration, 99% transpiration. And he was then looking for other things and a genuine interest in widening his horizon all over his life. That was really interesting. That's why he played with Capelli or, or uh, uh, Ravi Shankar. Mm -hmm. And these are not great things to write home about. The recordings with Capelli is uh. not jazz and the recording with Ravi Shankar is not classical Indian music. Mm -hmm. um, but it I think it's his genuine interest. It was his genuine interest. And so was yoga his genuine interest. And I think the decline in his capacities would have come, and some people get old early. Me? Yeah, <laughs> true. It's true. Others play like Milstein till they are 80, and yeah. it's still clean. But uh, not because of yoga. I okay. don't think so. Now, we go back to, let's go back to the Orville Charter for a little bit. Okay. Because that's su such a subject. It's so important. Yes. And new people coming hardly know anything about it, wanting to join Orville. I'm very lenient on that one. Of course, it is uh, possible that 
uh, people come with just uh, attracted by nice uh, greenery or something like that. Um, it's the same as in the 70s, there were probably hippies coming and going uh, because of some romantic idea. Uh, Orville must have, and so far always had, uh, the capacity to, after one, two, three, five years, these people are going again. There is a natural selection process. Although I must say, for my generation of Aurovillians, because life is rather unpleasant. I could have had a much more pleasant life. Of course. Where I came from. So you must, uh, uh, you must have some belief or uh, uh, something where you say, oh, there I get something. Something real is happening that otherwise may not happen at home. I verified that frequently. When I came, I traveled in the beginning every year or every second year to Germany with the children for the grandparents mm. and so on. So I was always there for three to four weeks reconnecting to my former colleagues and so on. And I always could see, ah, no, I'm very well, I'm very well sitting in Oroville. Ah, most interesting. Yeah, it was very good. Super clear it came, me with my, uh, with my anti-government uh, and anti-police and, you know, these kind of things. I came two years after being Aurovillian, uh, two years I, I was there, I had the chance to work something, but I needed a computer from a friend. I took my mom's car, there was a little uh, parking problem, and uh, the result was um, the police came and checked the car of my mother. Somebody had written down the, the number plate and they said, yes, that's the car. And there was a very small scratch. Uh, and they said, okay, this is, I don't know the English term. If you leave a place of accident without, uh, mm. you know, that is... Uh, uh, it's a criminal offense. It's a criminal. Yeah. Uh, so they mm. arrested me, particularly also because I had the passport, but I was not in Germany. Uh, uh, it was my parents' house. So they had to take me. And then I was there with the police all afternoon. And it was the Bavarian police. And they said, I know we saw it. There was nothing, actually. You could not even see any problem. Mm. I said, I, I went out of the car. There was no problem. And he says, yeah, yeah we know, but uh, you should have called the police. And now it's difficult because now we have to, you know, arrest you. And it was horrible. And mm. then I was lucky. The owner of this car that I had touched came in and she had long fingernails with a, with a ring inside and not what German policemen like. And she was very arrogant. So suddenly they were on my side. And they started to do everything they could in order to get me home on the same day. They arrested me and there was little Jonas staying with me. Papa, where are you going? Uh, oh. <laughs> it was crazy. And I was so calm all the time. And I did not develop this, this puberty resentment against the bad police and stuff like that. Because I said, they, these people are apparently doing their job. It's very okay. They're friendly people. And in the end, they, they said, the best we can do for you is we knock that off, we knock that off, but you have to pay 500, which was about half of what I could earn in the next two weeks. And I was not even angry about that. So they brought me home in their police car and apologized. And it was like very amicable. And I was very clear. I could mm. not ever have dreamed of some me being in this condition. But your calmness without, was everything. Without Trio Bindos yeah. uh, and Oroville's training and clarity and and that was for me just illustrative. I said, oh, this is really happening. I didn't even realize I changed so much. That's wonderful. So things like what that. Year, what year was this? 94, I think. 
Oh, you were 36 years old. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 Very good. Not, it was not, it, I couldn't believe myself that yeah. this is, this is really that happening. You were so calm during yes. this whole What's thing. wonderful. I, I'd like to ask you to, to share some of uh, the things you are doing now in recording and because you have such a background. Yeah. Well, now, right now, we are doing readings, of course, uh, which is very nice for me because I can read these texts many times before I can send them off as edited and cleaned. That's yes. very good. Um, well, the other thing you're doing, I would making, like making the sentences is so valuable to me. Ah, yeah. This one. Yeah. This is very good, yeah. Reading, reading uh, um, something like uh, human unity, the ideal of human unity, sometimes the sentences are really long mm -hmm. and I would say tedious to read. And when I write it on the sc for you on the screen, first of all, I make a new paragraph for every sentence. And then I see where is the next line coming to make it more clear while you read. So you can read it without uh, thinking too much back and forth, which results in wrong breathings and hesitations that are not motivated mm -hmm. and all that. Yes. So that was working very fine for both of us and required me to understand every sentence fully and not go on which, as a normal reader, I would do. Ah. Yeah, impatience. Sure, we would pass. Yeah, yeah I got over. that. No, you yeah. didn't. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, five sentences later, you need that, what he just said. Otherwise, you don't understand anymore what's coming. So that was, that's at the moment uh, very uh, rewarding for me. In terms of music, also, I was always, I always feel I could take up work that is very rewarding. For the 50th anniversary, for example, I took a uh, organ improvisation or harmonium improvisation by mother uh, and uh, transcribed it. So I noted, I, I wrote every note she played. Takes a bit of a time. Yes. And it's very, very interesting. Uh, I have to say, from in terms of background, mother is not a very good musician. She is not a very skilled player, and she is also basically not a composer. So she is much less of a musician than she is as a painter. As a painter, she is more skilled, was more skilled or whatever. Um, so I had... Um, I was very interested in doing that and see, like, what does that do to me when I listen to this that closely? Mm. That I can. This is very interesting. I want to go deeply into this. Yes, I think this is one of the most interesting things I did in the past ten years was to transcribe this, and then I set it for organ because she famously always wanted an organ in Oroville, which, for practical reasons, got, luckily never happened because in this humidity it will not be useful. Um, but anyway, I put it on church organ and solved this with uh, samples of, of real church organs. And uh, I uh, found a retired church organist, uh, a Dutch uh, fellow, mm. and said, please go back to your work and do this. And he reluctantly at first agreed. And uh, then I put orchestra uh, also. I see. Yeah. So there were flute and clarinet and saxophone, soprano saxophone I had as a kind of oboe, uh, um, and uh, violins and uh, uh, percussion. And so the best I could do in terms of orchestra. And then I put choir on it also. Ooh. So the Oroville Choir was singing that. And I, for that one, I used uh, lyrics, uh, excerpts from Savitri mostly, which I basically, around the theme, uh, searched by 
what is the feeling I need here? Where is some poetry of that? Mm. So it's a hodgepodge of lines. Um, and uh, yeah, and Nuria was doing a fantastic work to then actually put this into reality with the uh, with the choir, choir yes. and and practiced a lot. And uh, why it was so fantastic for me to do this work is because uh, when you are not receiving the music of mother, this is very, but you are very actually playing it with point, yes. which with, with every with every cell, <laughs> then you can take that extra. Actually, I must say, having not such a great opinion of her as a musician to start with, I said like, oh my God, that's such a good improvisation. Because I'm a, I'm a jazz musician, f more even than a classical musician, so I know very practical and from life experience what it is to improvise music. Uh, and um, the uninterrupted flow of consciousness that I admire with only the very, very best of the improvising artists. This is what is truly breathtaking, when, uh, when not a skilled uh, series of phrases is displayed, but there is an idea which goes through a solo of a long time, like, for example, with Keith Jarrett. Hmm. Almost always when he plays um, of, of the younger ones, Brad Meldau. This is so wonderful. And Mother has that. She doesn't have the, the skill to do that on very complicated phrases or very uh, complicated chord progressions. She, just, that doesn't, she doesn't have the library. But the consciousness is yes. super evolved. Well, what I would like to share with you on this is that uh, my feeling has always been many people don't like mother's music. Mm. They don't like to listen to it. Mm. And I felt it was like seeds falling to the earth. All right. And someone would have to grow those plants or, yeah. or germinate those seeds yeah. into an orchestral setting. Yeah. And you've done it. Yeah, I've done that. Wow. Yeah, it's somewhere. There is a video I can give you. Uh, it was basically one, one year that I worked on that. Mm. Pretty much full time. <laughs> well, then we should get into Sunil's music for a little bit. Right. In this context, for the 18th, there was also a very, very good pianist in Oroville. Some man called Frank Gutschmidt. Mm. Absolute high-end, modern, classical pianist can play everything it's a genius really a genius musically mm. he knows everything that stockhausen ever wrote for keyboard he knows it by heart oh yeah yeah it's unbelievable so he also plays wonderfully mozart i played a beethoven sonata the 10th with him in 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 orville and uh, the day before that he played all the full goldberg by heart goldberg variations a very memorable concert uh, and um, he helped, he had to go before this performance, he had to go because he had concerts in Europe, uh, but for the rehearsals he played the piano that I had uh, written, additionally to the organ, uh, which was sort of central, and uh, it was very interesting. So he is some sort of a Sunil fan, so he said, no, this, you know, this one and that one. And then he plays chord progressions of Sunil's music. And he mm. says, oh, this is wonderful and see what. And I'm like, sorry, I don't hear it. <laughs> ah. So, but because of his respect, I said, okay, let's do it. So in the concert that we played together, we did as an encore, a piece of Sunil played by Nada Prem on the viola and me on the violin and uh, Frank on the, oh. on the grand piano. And um, still, it doesn't reach me. Hmm? Still, it doesn't reach me. I did it, I played it, I analyzed it, and I have done that exercise with a few other pieces of Sunil also. 
re-recording it, transcribing it, and no. Okay, well, I always... Doesn't work for me. I always felt that Sunil was a transition mm. into a new experiment. Mm. And then when Mother spoke to me to bring down a new music, mm. that it had to be something even higher because mm. she said you have to bring the pure music down. Mm. And you know that Stockhausen was a disciple of Sri Aurobindo. Yeah, I know. That's why Frank Kutschmidt came to Auroville. Ah. Because he was Stockhausen, he was Stockhausen's okay. pianist. Wow. So he came to Auroville uh, uh, mm. already like uh, 90, probably 96 or something like that. And uh, we had a concert in Pitanga Hall. And uh, after that concert, everybody was gone, but there was still the piano. And Carol was there and Nuria was there and, and a singer called Jung Mi at the time. And then this young man came, says, are you Holger? I'm like, yeah. Um, I'm new here and I'm also a musician. I said, oh, nice. What you play? Piano. I could play a concert if you want. I said, okay. What would you play? Mm, I don't know. And I'm like, okay. Uh, uh, sit here as a piano, play. So he was playing uh, 15 minutes of um, Zodiac of Stockhausen. And we were all like, oh my God. Nobody spoke. All these five, six people that were there was like, and it was the first time I heard Stockhausen and said like, oh my God, how good is this music? Because he could bring that to such a beautiful life. So he says, yeah. Uh, so I said, okay, oh. um, where do you stay? I just arrived yesterday. I say, uh, I don't know where to stay in Oroville. I said, I know. So stay in my here. house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was wonderful. Well, I want to ask you next about someone that I've not been able to connect with, mm. who has said that all his music came from Sri Aurobindo. Okay. Giacinto Celsi. I never heard. <gasps> who? G? Giacinto, G-I-A-C-I-N-T-O, S-C-E-L-S-I. I have to hear. Okay. Oh my gosh, yes, oh you gosh. do. Okay. And he composed for all kinds of instruments. Mm. And he said it came purely from Sri Aurobindo. Mm. Now, I cannot get into it, but that's my... Well, perhaps I my, have to hear that. My lack. Maybe I find it fascinating or not. Um, where is inspiration coming from? Mm -hmm. uh, when I was young, I came, I, I, I saw something in the television, a bearded man, and he was, the interviewer said, um, please tell us, where is music coming from? Where is your music coming from? And he looked in the camera, and there was, 30 seconds silence in the German television, and I'm like, oops, what's going on? Then he says, music is coming from silence. I said, ah, this is interesting. Who's that man? It was Arvo Pert. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's how I saw first time uh, Arvo Pert. Yeah. And I like it. And I believe this is quite close to the truth. I do also. I really do. And if I say this, music doesn't come from Mozart, music doesn't come from Sri Aurobindo either. Music comes from silence. Then I understand that when I read Sri Aurobindo, there is a kind of all over vibration, right? Yes. And that is a similar thing to when I play uh, Mozart. There is a feel, there is a kind of vibration to all that Mozart writes that's impressive. And I can very well, in this case, very well distinguish between, um, usually can, between uh, something that is coming from the time, classical music at that time in Austria, say. Mm -hmm. Just at the moment I play with a student, I play uh, Michael Haydn uh, duos, mm. violin, viola. And two of the greatest compositions are uh, in, for violin and viola are the duos by Mozart. They are fantastic. Towering compositions for such weird combination of yeah, two instruments. Yeah. And Michael Haydn actually also did that. He is the younger brother of Josef Haydn. 
And he actually got the job that Mozart declined at the archbishop in Salzburg. Mozart said, no, I don't want to be around my dad. I go better uh, to Vienna. So Michael Haydn got that job and they were friends. So one time uh, Mozart traveled back to um, to Salzburg with Constanze and uh, it is known that Michael had a family and spent a lot of time with them and was not such a workhorse. And uh, he had to bring six duets for viola and violin to the archbishop. He wanted that. It was a job to be done, to earn his money. And then his daughter was sick and he said to Mozart, to Wolfgang, he says, you have something lying around? I have to give this oh. next week. And he says, no, but I can make. And then he wrote these two fantastic pieces. And actually, he gave it like this to Michael Haydn. And Michael Haydn had his six pieces giving to the archbishop. Now, it's super interesting to play those two pieces of Mozart and those four pieces of Michael Haydn. And probably the archbishop didn't realize, but I do. <laughs> it's a different feeling. But where? Because all the uh, skill sets and so on, that's all the same. The way it goes there, but somewhat something is a little bit not so great. Yes. Yes. And when this Mr. says his music is coming from Sri Aurobindo, uh, to me, uh, this is a paraphrasing that he is liking to be in this vibration. But Stockhausen said the same thing. Yes. <laughs> Still. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I know somebody who knows Stockhausen very well. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, <laughs> and Stockhausen was till his very end uh, egomaniac. Oh, yes. Nothing particularly special. He was a musician, so uh, noble and a great one. Back to the silence, I think it was Otto Schnabel who said, I play the same notes as everyone, but the difference is in the silence between the notes. Oh, beautiful. Very beautiful. Huh? Yeah, this is very good. Yeah. And this silence is not Sri Aurobindo's silence. I don't think so. No. Not, uh, not for me. Yeah. That is so much more pervasive. So. It's the silence that Sri Aurobindo draws from, that yeah, I believe. Exactly. And then, if I cannot directly contact this silence, which I can most of the time not, yeah, if I cannot, then Sri Aurobindo can be for me a help to contact that silence. Yes, very true. Well, this is for me, so. And so, one importunes him to help us yes. in that silence. Yes. And the help comes. For me, it's in poetry. It comes all the time. Yes. And I'm always remembering him and thanking him because I'm not a poet. Ah. <laughs> I would never consider myself. I never studied poetics. See, but that is the question of skill set. Yeah. Uh, in that sense, I would say mother was not a musician, but you know, she can still sit down and, and play. So um, that depends what you want to do with it. And she contacts maybe not so much the silence as more a particular um, vibration that she expresses in everything she does. So whether this is organizing an ashram or making a painting or saying something to Satpram in the agenda or playing something on the uh, organ, there's always the same consciousness. Yes. When she says, like, uh, yeah, I don't sleep in that sense. I just change the location of my work <laughs> when I sleep. At the time when I was young and read these things, I liked it, I found it impressive, but I had no experience on that. Yeah. But now sleep gets different with becoming a little older. Yes. And, and I get now more of that 
because sometimes I'm working in the sleep, consciously. Mm. Sometimes. I'd like to ask you to comment a bit on modern music, mm. modern classical music, uh, what your experience is in, in, these, in these current years of such turmoil. Mm. Worldwide, you mean? Worldwide, worldwide. Worldwide, yes. Well, for me, the, the now already not so modern anymore, the, the minimal music was very important. Mm -hmm. Steve Reich, Terry Riley, all very inspired by India, like me, very inspired by India and then eventually ending up here. Um, I thought that the, the spirit of search for yoga of cells, etc., is, is in this music the most. Oh. I feel this, this kind of static, but all the time permutating energy. For me, it's similar to a meditative. Uh, Can you send me a few pieces? Yeah. To listen you to? don't know Steve Reich? Hmm? Steve, Steve Reich? Reich? You don't know? I've, I've heard a little of his. I, the other so. one I've not heard. Ah, Terry Riley? No. Yeah, he was. He was actually. He is more or less the the initiator, uh, uh, important initiator of that music. Not having that, didn't get so much fame like te uh, like uh, Philip Glass, for example. He got famous with it. Uh, you know Philip Glass? Oh, very well. Ah, yeah. So Koyana Sadis. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. All these things. Yeah. Uh, uh, but Terry Riley wrote. Uh, I think must be maybe sixty-eight or something like that. He wrote a very important piece uh, to start lots of this movement, which was called In C, because it's a collection of, I think, 40 phrases, short phrases, uh, that um, an, a number of musicians play, like an orchestra. So the first musician would start alone with the first phrase, and then a second one joins him, and a third one joins him. Random instruments who is there, and then uh, by the time five players play, one of the players starts to play the second phrase. And then by the time the last player starts, the field is fully there, maybe 40 musicians play, then they play three, four different phrases. And then the whole thing moves through those phrases at random times. And what you hear is all the time changing, but you never hear why and when. So all the pieces fit together. That's why it's in C, because in the key of C. Uh, and uh, if you hear that, can last 25 minutes or last 40 minutes, depending on how many musicians and how they individually feel how they move on. Isn't that interesting? Very interesting. Exactly. I only have one example in Darist Ein Rose um, of the old uh, the Swedish Swedish fellow who put it into a totally different context. Hmm. There is a rose uh, blooming. I don't know. No. Hmm. Well, he took the first phrase and then they sang the whole thing through and then the first phrase was on top of the second phrase, and then the third phrase mm -hmm. came. Mm -hmm. And it's, it ends beautifully, but you go through all these permutations on the way, which are so, so interesting. Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. oh, uh, so for, for me, it was very interesting because it resonated very much with my idea of a society, how they work together. Uh, it was much more interesting than a fully written uh, 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 score with like uh, Beethoven sonata or so. Mm -hmm. uh, I felt that this way of prescribing exactly to everybody what he has to do in which moment, even if the result is fantastic and beautiful like a mm. Beethoven symphony, yes. it's somewhat exhausted what mankind can do with this. Yes. And um, therefore to have a 
uh, improvising orchestra, in a way improvising, mm -hmm. was very attractive. But of course, we see immediately the limitation is chaos and a kind of gray zone. Everybody plays everything, what he wants, yeah. that won't work. The sensitivity of total listening to what my partner is doing works with three people. I have done that a lot with four gets difficult, five very difficult. If the diversity of instruments is there, it's a little better. If there's a drummer who's doing that, he's doing it alone. The bass player is doing his job alone. The pianist is doing his job alone. The saxophonist is job alone. Then it kind of works better. But I played string quartet, everything sounds same. Free improvisation of four strings, which we did a lot, is precariously difficult. And if you have more of that, the problem is of graying out everything. You don't see shapes anymore. Wow. You don't see anything anymore. So it becomes useless. So I found that this trick that Terry Riley used to have 40 people playing, and it makes some kind of sense, and still it has an unprecedented amount of freedom while moving. I thought this is a very interesting, like a social experiment, like I believe Orville should be like everybody does what he wants but why does it still make sense because there is a kind of blueprint uh, 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 sense behind it which i believe is sufficiently given by mother and sri aurobindo yeah? so if everybody just reads and understands sri aurobindo in the way he wants of course and then not put any detailed regulations as, and on three we play Savitri. And, <laughs> you know, then we should be able to get a kind of um, obviously anarchistic uh, uh, project, which was for me always the attraction I had to Auroville. And I kind of uh, uh, enjoyed myself taking part in a 50 year old, still working. Yes. Project where nothing that happens, not so much, that happens is prescribed by a score. Mm. And here I should stop, otherwise we get political. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but is his music more classical or is it more jazz oriented? Terry Riley? Terry Riley. Uh, you would not hear much jazz, no? It's not very jazz. No, no, it's... But it's, when Wynton Marsalis had his group, yeah, was that... Well, then, no, that uh, Wynton Marsalis is, for me, a classical musician. Yeah. It's not interesting in terms of improvisation. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. His brother, I think, is a saxophonist. He is a very good saxophonist. He's rather... Uh, he is more of a jazz musician. I mean... Uh. In okay. my in of your, course, Wynton Marsalis will not agree, <laughs> and he's a towering player. So, but for me, he's a classical player uh, within the jazz. Where uh, do you frame. see music going from here? What I said, just I, what you said about Steve uh, Reich and uh, Terry yes, Riley. Yes, not necessarily in the the that was actually only like maybe living for two decades the minimal music. Then already yeah. it becomes classical. We have this as human beings, uh, 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 people who are moving in front of time, um, they have a certain urge, and then when they find something that is graspable by other people, then this becomes, it crystallizes very fast. Nowadays, very fast. So in jazz, there are, there are always living beings who do things that are not done 10 years ago. And generally, they are not famous. What I have experienced in minimal music is that there were a few high points. Arvo Pert, maybe Sir John Taverner a little mm -hmm. bit, but it didn't go too far, I felt. Yeah, uh, it's true, but it might be that the time of towering individuals like Mozart, Beethoven, and so on, um, is not what we should look for. Uh, this is why I have written the book, uh, The Descent of a New Music. Uh -huh. and now, mostly I'm into choral and uh -huh. vocal music. 
but I was able to pick out those composers that brought down a piece of something of the new music. Mm -hmm. And it goes across all countries, mm -hmm. from Russia to America. Mm. Mm. So I'll give you that book. Yeah, looking forward yeah. to that. Well, of course, it's mostly choral, based on choral composers. So that same thing, I believe, is true also for eminent spiritual personalities. Um, I think the development that I hope that I hope for is not waiting for another Jesus or another uh, 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 prophet in that sense, which were probably very admirable, towering people. But um, it's not what mankind needs. Another one of those, and I Mother, think. Yes, and Mother tells us that Sri Aurobindo is the last avatar. As that after this, there will be continual mm. evolution. Mm. It won't stop with the supermental. Mm. She says you'll go into the realms of Satchidananda and more and more explanation, sure. exploration. Sure, but then again, uh, uh, the people after Muhammad said he is the last prophet. So it, it, there is a tendency of, uh, so this is the last one. But it's already, um, it's already for me, in the, as I read Sri Aurobindo, it's already there that, uh, that better to lift gradually the total consciousness than to have one genius spiking yeah. out. Absolutely. And of course, mankind produces with different capacities always geniuses, sure. Yeah, we have those. We had Tesla. I mean. Yeah, or yes, and in music, you have them all the time. Fantastic. This is Brad Meldau. This is Pat Metheny. This is Keith Jarrett. In that field, in the classic field, I don't know so much. I know more about jazz. Uh, so, but this is, of course, when they play, they are able to bring something back to so many other musicians like me that are don't that don't have that kind of individual genius. Hmm? That is beautiful. Thank you for them. Yes. But uh, we have to understand, I think it's helpful to understand that uh, the consciousness of mankind is, say, like a mountain, and there will be a piece, a rock, will be on top, and it will be on the very top, so this is fantastic. But if the other stones of the mountains are not there, this stone will fall down straight. It's not flying there by itself. Mm -hmm. It is just on top. And other stones are outside, further down. And again, other stones are right in the middle of the mountains because it's not hollow. They don't even see ever the light. And they are important. As he said yesterday, because nothing is important, uh, is, is unimportant in this yes. creation, he says. No? Some are petty, some are grandiose, Uh, but the petty, wasn't it somehow like that? Yeah. You read yes, it yesterday. It yes, yes. Yeah, that's nice. I like that sentence very much. So as a musician, you should not look out, or an artist, or any, you should not look out to be, what I did a lot, uh, to be like the stone on top. Uh -huh. Next to Beethoven or <laughs> Schubert. My God, Schubert suffered so much that he is not next to Beethoven. Totally pointless. Yeah. He should have seen where he is. It would be fantastic enough. <laughs> Because each one has his own gift to give. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. So that to modify this, uh, this uh, philosophy and say, this is, this is totally beyond an individual, no matter how genius that individual is. This is something we shall and can practice in Oroville very well. Yes. But everyone who is there... One guy plants trees, some other guy makes music, some other guy doesn't know what to do with his life. Same. The one descended into the multitude. Yes, so better you, you, you appreciate that multitude. Yes. Rather than saying we have nothing achieved and stuff like that. What does that even say? Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. Namaste.